take them to the commons. We've got a bit of a smaller crowd today, which will be fun and intimate. So we're going to sing some songs. Feel free to stand with us or stay seated, whatever's most comfortable for you. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out on turn back to praise when the darkness closes in lord still i will say blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glory Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. I'll lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I give it all to you, God, trusting that you'll make something something beautiful out of me. I lean not on my 
mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open there's nothing I hold on to there's nothing I hold on to there's nothing I hold nothing I hold on to. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in my hands of the maker of heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and you put me back together you gave me strength to find a new gardens you give beauty for ashes 
You turn mourning to dancing. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Thanks for singing with us. I think we're going to have Carrie give us some announcements now. Feel free to be seated. Hey everyone, I'm Carrie, and I just have a few announcements for you about things that we have um, coming up in the next few weeks here. The first is uh, this Monday, so tomorrow at 5.30, we'll have volleyball at the NAU Southfield. So everyone is welcome to that, even if you don't want to play volleyball and just want to hang out with some friends, um, there will be a crew there. Um, we do have yoga this week, um, so that's going to be Thursday, August 3rd. Um, here at Trinity Heights and the Celebration Hall, and that's going to be at 5.30 p.m. Um, it's a free class, so if you enjoy yoga at all, you should definitely come, and it's going to be led by Rachel Krug, so that'll be awesome, and it sounds like uh, the class is going to end with a sound bath, which also sounds really cool, so if you haven't experienced that before, um, definitely join us for that. And then Friday is the first Friday art walk, so our office will be open. Our office is downtown. If you haven't been there before, it's just above Aloha Barbecue downtown. And this week we are featuring um, Sarah Henderson's macrame art, so that'll be really cool to see. Um, our office will be open from 5 to 8 p.m., so come on down and hang out, and I'm sure we'll have some food um, and drinks to share, too. Next, we have the Commons Camp Out, and that's only three weeks away. So that's going to be August 18th through the 20th. We're going to be camping both Friday and Saturday night. Um, you're welcome to come for one night or both nights, or even if you just want to come hang out during the day. Um, any of those days, you're welcome to join us. Um, we're going to be providing a porta potty and s'mores um, and firewood. So everything else is bring your own, but those things will be provided for you. Um, and then we won't be having church service on Sunday, August 20th. We won't be having church service here. Instead, we'll do like a mini service um, out at our camp spot on Sunday morning. So um, that'd be fun if you can't camp that weekend, but you want to come for the Sunday service, it would be in the morning at the camp spot. Um, and then lastly, or second to last actually, um, we announced last week that we're going to be moving locations. Um, so if you missed that announcement, um, this is our new location, Flagstaff Federated downtown, and we will be meeting there starting on the 27th. So it's really not that far out, and we're super, super excited. We do have a couple things that we're trying to um, kind of do as a team before we move in there. So specifically, we're going to be working on some of the kids' rooms, renovating them a little bit. And so if that's something you're excited about or you have some extra time to help move furniture, do some painting, I think we're going to be tearing out some carpet. Um, we have a sign-up sheet in our lobby area that's just for helping out with getting Federated ready for our services. So if you have some time, definitely check out the sign-up sheet. If you're not interested in renovating but you'd still like to help us get over there, we do have a few um, items that we need to purchase to make those kids' rooms usable, so you're always welcome to donate <laughs> to those things. Um, but that would just be uh, putting money in the giving box or sending us a little bit on Venmo and saying that you would like that to go to the kids' classroom. Um, and then lastly, we had just a last-minute um, announcement. I'm not sure if there's a slide for this one, but I hope Charlie will tell you more about this. Okay, there is a slide. Good. Um, so the Northern Arizona Interfaith Council is having a fundraiser on August 19th. Um, it's from 4 to 6 p.m., and it's a dinner, and you can buy a ticket and go to the dinner to support the Northern Arizona Interfaith Council. Um, tickets are $20, and all of the funds will go to the different um, programs and activities that they um, sponsor in our community. Some of those things we partner with them on. One of those is our, um, our food boxes that we put together on Mondays. Um, and then I know they teach uh, literacy classes, and um, I am not the right person to be giving this announcement, so I'm sure Charlie will tell you more about it. But if you're interested in supporting them, it'd be really cool to have a table of commons people there. So grab your ticket. Charlie has them. They're $20, and I'm sure it'll be a really good time. And that's it. 
Thank you, Kerry, so much. You were the perfect person for that announcement. That was just right. So NAIC is a huge partner organization that we are a part of here at the Commons, and we love what they do. They have been, yeah, very, very integral part of a lot of the community work that we get to do, and um, they need resources and people to know what they're doing. So I'll be there that night. So yeah, if you're interested, come let me know, and we'll let you know about that. Welcome, and thank you for being here today on this monsoony Sunday. We love praying for other churches in town, and so today we're going to pray for the Greek Orthodox Church. If you are the praying type, we're going to lift them up. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the weather. Thank you for our community. Um, I'm thankful for the Greek Orthodox Church and the friends that I have that go there. Um, I'm thankful for their ancient tradition. I'm thankful for the way they have shined a light in the Eastern world for a long time. I'm thankful for their traditions. And Lord, we pray today uh, that they will feel our love and more importantly, your love as they've gathered this morning. And we pray, um, as always, help us as we open up scriptures uh, to open our hearts and minds to each other and to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, uh, I, our, two of our kids are in Texas. A lot of times I just got back from Texas, but since we have older kids now, my oldest daughter, Aspen, drove our youngest son, Blaze, to Texas yesterday. So that was very stressful for, our, for us anyway, for our 17-year-old to drive our 12-year-old. We talked extensively to Aspen about how to drive on I-40 safely, but they made it alive, which is good. So Mom and I relaxed a little bit, although she did just whisper in my ear that our, our son Colt got pulled over, so I don't know what that's about. So I'll just share that publicly. <laughs> yeah. So the adventures of parenting uh, teenagers who drive. Yeah, I don't know. What, I'll find out later how that happened. So <laughs> that's good news. Um, but it was fun. As Blaze was driving with Aspen, uh, he was sending texts of like a lightning storm that they went through because he loves weather. He's our little meteorologist, and uh, Sierra can confirm he's a huge nerd when it comes to meteorology and weather. And today, there was a big monsoon happening at our house. I'm sure a lot of you guys got caught in it. And where we were, there was like big thunder, like thunder bombs going off, and I was videoing it to send to Blaze to taunt him that he should never have left home in the first place because it's more beautiful and more, more weather here. But I was having that normal uh, Flagstaff monsoon moment, which I'm sure many of you have had, which I would call numinous or connective, any of those nature moments where everything feels very, very alive. And it made me uh, feel very excited about the opportunity to be together tonight to continue our discussion on Christian mystics. We've been in a long discussion now for the last several weeks called The Mystery of God, and we're looking at voices in history who are known as Christian mystics because I think, and actually the author we're going to talk about today would agree with this, now, one of the things that we miss out on in modern-day expressions of our faith is the experiential or the mystical experience. Now, mysticism is not unique to Christianity. There are Jewish mystics. In fact, I studied Jewish mysticism in the University of Texas. There are Hindu mystics, and there are Islamic and Sufi and Jainist and Buddhist. There's all sorts of mystics, and all it means is people who, when they think about their religious or their spiritual experience, they want to know what it means to have a real feeling or experience of the divine or God. So obviously, when we talk about Christian mystics, we're talking about one specific branch of Christianity, of thinkers who write and talk about what it means to be known by God or to know God or to experience God. Now, sometimes people think of it as a little bit more uh, over the top, and, and, and some expressions of mysticism are. One of my favorite experiences ever is I got to see the whirling dervishes in uh, Istanbul one time who are the Islamic mystics who spin around a lot in this beautiful dance form with this sort of like garb that flows around. It's kind of a tourist attraction in Istanbul, but they're actually Islamic mystics. That's the way they experience the divine, or they would say Allah, which means one God. The way they experience Allah is they get dizzy, which I think is hilarious. They basically get so dizzy that they get into an altered state, and then they think about how they can maybe connect with God through that experience. So I was thinking what we could do right now is everybody stand up in your chair. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of no's. Let's get as dizzy as we can and see if that helps us experience God. 
Christian mystics have done all sorts of different things too. The desert mothers and the desert fathers, they've lived in ivory towers. In fact, when you hear of an ivory tower in academia, it's actually a reference to old Christians who used to live up in these ivory white towers, and people would come and ask for advice from these hermits that would live in the towers of academia and share their knowledge. But we have looked at ancient Christian mystics. We've looked at some from medieval times and Renaissance times. We're going to talk about a more modern mystic today. The last two mystics we've looked at, Julian of Norwich and Teresa of Avila, have been women. But today we're going to look at a 20th century, 1900s man named Thomas Merton. A lot of you have probably heard the name Thomas Merton before. He's quoted a lot. But he was born in 1915 in France but he grew up in the United States. His mother, who he was close to at a young age, like most mothers and children, died at his age of six. And he and his little brother were raised by a dad who was less involved, sent him to a boarding school. But he did have a lot of privilege in New York, and he ended up going to Columbia University. He went to Cambridge in the UK for a while. He ended up coming back to Columbia and getting his PhD. He studied linguistics and literature, and he really wasn't super interested in, in faith until he actually first encountered um, a monk who was a Hindu monk when he was in New York studying his PhD, and he got really interested in the idea of a religious mysticism or an experience that this Hindu person had that they experienced God. And for him, he went and actually talked to this Hindu monk and was saying, hey, I'm actually really interested in this. Should I convert to Hinduism? And I think this is a really beautiful part of the story. The Hindu monk said, no, probably not. I mean, do you have roots in Christianity? And he's like, yeah, I was in the Church of England. He was like, oh, Christianity has some of the greatest mysticism available. There's no need to convert to my religion. And by the way, what a model for interfaith dialogue, especially when we come from a tradition of colonialism and a, a movement that has literally killed people to convert. Not always. There's obviously been good-minded good people who want to offer religion to people, but I love that this Hindu monk was like, no, find your family in your home and in your own tradition. In fact, he was so knowledgeable of the Christian faith, he told him to go read Augustine, the city of God, and the imitation of Christ from Thomas Aquinas. And so Merton said, I'll do that. So he went and read these books, and he ended up converting to Catholicism after months of researching Catholicism, and he became a Catholic Trappist monk. I don't want to spend too much on his life because it was his writings that I think that I hope to maybe just tiny bit, tip of the iceberg, give you a taste of so you might go read some of Thomas Merton's work. I'll just say this as a personal anecdote. When I had the privilege of studying in Scotland, Thomas Merton was one of the most influential thinkers that I read, especially when we did a whole module on interfaith dialogue. And we're announcing the Northern Arizona Interfaith Council tonight. This is something I'm really passionate about because I didn't see it modeled well in my Christian faith growing up. Because part of what I was taught is that Christianity is the one true religion and the only true way to get to God. And some of you might be going, yeah, that's what I was taught too. And I just want you to know that my experience of the Christian faith, my experience of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, and my experience of what the church can be is that Jesus and Christianity and our faith is so much bigger than some small-minded, we have the one secret to life and every other group that's not us is out mindset. And I think that's actually really good news. I know some Christians that that feels really uncomfortable with, but let me just tell you, the reason that's really good news is because it means God is so much better than we ever imagined, so much bigger than we ever imagined. And that whatever we mean by God, by love, by the divine, the thing that we believe in our faith tradition was incarnate of Jesus of Nazareth in this universal Christ, is that that God would want to be known and known through all of God's children. And that's the beautiful thing about mystics. Thomas Merton became a very faithful Christian. I want to be really clear about this. He wrote over 50 books as a, a monk in Kentucky about interfaith dialogue, and he never once said all faiths are the same. That's not what interfaith dialogue is. Interfaith dialogue is my faith and your faith may be different, but we probably have some common experiences. And I don't have to devalue faith to value my faith. I don't have to devalue your faith to value my faith. Let me say that again, clearer, because I stumbled through that. There's no reason or need to devalue or lessen someone else's faith or lack of faith to increase the value of your faith. Isn't that a little bit intuitive? Wouldn't it be kind of weird if your worldview or your faith system somehow got better by belittling other worldviews? Yet how many of you, like me, grew up with an experience of Christianity that somehow, subtly, maybe not explicitly, 
we thought we for sure have the best one, and we need to belittle other people's faith so we can feel better about our own. How would we tell our children, by the way, if they were behaving like that? Oh, you only feel good when you tear your friends down, and, and is it because you tear them down because they're different from you? It doesn't feel very good or intuitive, right? The good news is Christianity has never demanded at its core that it be this exclusionary, we're better than you thing. In fact, the beautiful thing about Christ, the beautiful thing about the movement of Christianity that exploded around the world, that it was originally quite the opposite of that. It was a minority of people who believed they were loved and God loved everyone and everyone can be included in that. And it's always been a really big vision. So for me, Thomas Merton was one of the voices that I came across who was writing books from the 40s, 50s, and 60s of the 20th century where I'm going, wow, this is relevant today. He traveled the world. He met the Dalai Lama. He met Thich Nhat Hanh. Many of you might have been here a few years ago when we did our summer book club and we did Living Buddha, Living Christ, which was written by the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. He was very good friends with Thomas Merton. And again, Thomas Merton never left his Christian faith to enter into these things. He was interested in the way in which the common human experience is to figure out how we can connect with God. So what I want to do in this whole series is go to the Scriptures, to one particular passage that each of these mystics used often. Thomas Merton talked a lot about one particular parable of Jesus, one of the most famous of all time. I wanted to read it together and then read just a few quotes from Thomas Merton, and hopefully that'll start a good conversation for us to think about the way in which maybe we can experience God in the same way. This is the story of the prodigal son, one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told, and for good reason. He quotes it from Luke. Luke is the only gospel author who tells this parable, and Luke 15 is one of my favorite chapters because it actually contains three stories that Jesus tells. One of the reasons I'm still so compelled to follow Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus' philosophical teaching style. He was someone who believed that the kingdom of heaven belonged to children and to people of color and to people on the other end of the powerful and those that weren't in the religious structured system. And so he believed to talk about God, we should tell stories about God. And Luke 15 is three different stories, a story of someone who lost a sheep and goes out of their way to find the lost sheep, a story of a woman who lost a coin and goes out of her way to find a lost coin. And by the way, God is the woman in this parable because God was very, Jesus was very comfortable using the female language to describe God. And then finally, the story of the prodigal son, arguably one of the most famous parables of Jesus. I'll read it, and then we'll talk about what Merton had to say. In verse 11, Jesus says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Um, this opening section of the story makes a lot more sense if you are an ancient Near Eastern person or even a modern Middle Eastern person. To us, it escapes us sometimes to think about what's going on here. But in a very patriarchal society where property was passed down from a father to their sons and women weren't considered able to vote or anything like that. It was very simple, and it's not that different from a lot of American system of inheriting when a parent dies. This son basically was saying the equivalent in the Middle Eastern world of, you mean nothing to me, Dad, and you are basically dead to me. Give me my money now. I'm not even going to wait around for you to die. And many Middle Eastern commentators have noted that there's a powerful element that would have been shocking to a first century Palestinian listener going, this guy said what to his dad? You would never say that to your dad. More shocking to that first century listener would be the sentence that the dad said, okay, and gave him his inheritance. So these are simple sentences, but it says he divided up his property and, and gave it to him. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Again, just a little Middle Eastern context, you probably know this, but ancient Jewish people and modern and Islamic friends from the Middle East do not view pigs as the cleanest and best of things to be involved with. In fact, it's part of their purity code and their food codes that you don't touch anything from pigs. Pigs are the most disgusting of animals to them. And so again, there's this context in this first century story that would have been shocking. 
a wealthy son tells his dad he's basically dead to him. The dad, shockingly, as a bad parent, is like, okay, here's your money. He goes off, he ruins it all, and he's there wanting to eat the food that the pigs are eating. When he came back to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him as filled and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. They began to party. This story, I'm sure most of you have heard at some point. Um, If you were like me and you grew up in a religious context, you've probably heard it a lot. Maybe you haven't heard it as much. There's so many beautiful things that I think makes this story echo through time. I think there's a reason it's so famous, the raw compassion of an unconditional love of a father who doesn't care about the message from the son, who doesn't care about what he's done. There's no earning the love back. There's no religious ceremony needed. There's something very mystical about this story. There's something that I think has resonated with people outside of grand cathedrals and organized church for a long time that to be known by God or to experience God has little or nothing to do with a professional pastor or priest or ordination or rites or ceremonies, that there's something about God who just compassionately loves us and can't wait for any of us to return home. Merton talked a lot about the homeness of this. Returning home is a spiritual journey. It was one of his favorite messages. There's a lot in the Middle Eastern context. Men didn't pick up their robes and cry and run. This was not dignified. This was a very undignified thing that the dad did. The dad was watching on the horizon, waiting for his beloved son to come home. And many, many, many Middle Eastern scholars would say the section that I'm cutting off is the most important, where the older brother complains about not having the fattened calf and that that's actually the main point of the parable, which I think may very well be true. So I just want to make a little side note, go back and read that later and wrestle with who is the older brother in this story. That's the power of story, right? Story Story is art, and it can say something to us. It can inspire a conversation in us, and those are questions we should wrestle with. But I just want to focus on Merton and his mystical interpretation and the way he taught this story, because I think it's really beautiful. What he saw in it was, first of all, most importantly, simply the same childlike part of the story that should resonate with all of us, all that was just said. But he always framed it as a map to the spiritual journey. One of the things Thomas Merton, I think, taught me is that there is a very central aspect of all mystical religion that focuses on the false self and the true self. Now, just think for a second about your own self. That's probably pretty easy to understand that there is in each of us a false self and a true self. For me, and probably for you as well, I think of the false self as the person that I put out there for you to see. Like, you're probably getting mostly false self right now, holding a microphone, just trying to talk to you, thinking, hey, what are they thinking of me, and how are we interacting? And as when I go around my day and I interact with people, the reality is most of us as human beings are interacting on the false self level, and that's also not bad. Merton and many mystics are not saying that we're evil or we should feel shame about that. It's just the nature of being social creatures. But there is also something deeper, the true self, And this is the thing that Thomas Merton says is the self that was made in the divine image. And he goes back to that ancient Jewish story, an ancient poem written in Genesis that we were made in the image of God, and that is our true self. And mystics of all faith, but especially Christian mystics like Thomas Merton say that part of the spiritual quest is for us to get in touch with our true self, the divine self. He was obsessed with the incarnation of Jesus. His favorite doctrine of Christianity that he found most compelling was that God would put skin on and live among us, that Jesus was saying God is in our flesh. We are connected with divinity in all of our hearts. And he saw in the story of the prodigal son, the story of the spiritual journey, all of us 
along the way are going to go through the dark night of the soul. None of us are exempt from it. We can put forth a false self all we want. It works in our relationships, but if we're honest with those that are the very closest to us, if we're fortunate enough to have close enough people to us, we've been through some stuff, and we maybe brought some stuff on ourselves that was painful. In Merton's understanding of this simple children's story that's echoed through time is that it actually is true. God is always there waiting for us to return to our true self in God's unconditional love. What I was thinking I would do to just close our time, which I started doing the last few weeks, is just almost like the book of Proverbs. One of the things I like about Proverbs is just these random sayings, one after the other. And sometimes when you read through them, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant. But I wanted to go through and just give you a handful of Thomas Merton quotes and talk about them just for a second. To think about the spiritual journey, some of the legacy that he left behind as little conversation starters for us to think about how we might, in, in the deepest parts of who we are, connect with and re-know that we are loved by God. And that could have immense implications for our experience of life. Trey, let's just throw those quotes up there and we'll go through them one at a time. This is something that he said, solitude is not something you must hope for in the future. Rather, it is a deepening of the present. And unless you look for it in the present, you will never find it. You know, monks, Trappist monks, Christian mystics, all mystics, solitude's a really big deal to them because they understand to get past the false self to this true self, you're going to need solitude. And they do it in extreme ways, but one of the things I valued from almost every single monk or nun or mystical or contemplative person I've ever learned from is they all believe that we can all experience it in the present, in the reality, without ivory towers, without hermitages, all of us have access to solitude. Now, how interesting is that idea that if you're hoping for some moment in the future you're going to get solitude, this monk who spent the last three decades of his life in a little tiny room is saying, if you can't find it in the present where you are, you won't find it in the future. I think that's a really, really intriguing concept. I think that's a really deeply spiritual idea to find our true self and our connection to God. Next one. By reading the scriptures, I'm so renewed that all nature seems renewed around me and with me. The sky seems to be a purer, a cooler blue. The trees a deeper green. The whole world is charged with the glory of God, and I feel fire and music under my feet. Um, I chose this particular quote because this feels very mystical. This is the sort of language of the experience of nature or God. I also chose this quote because I love that contra what many of us have experienced, he said it's by reading Scripture that these things happen. (laughs) I don't know about you, but that's not always my experience of reading the Bible. Uh, The world is not always alight with the glory of God, especially depending on what part I'm reading. But that doesn't mean that that hasn't happened. And it doesn't mean that if we can reclaim, especially in our own tradition, the real value that this library of texts is with all of their art, with all of their liberation, with all of their speaking truth to power through prophecy, with all of their hope, with all their message of love, with all of their stories that children and adults alike can understand, if we can't reclaim it from the fundamentalist religion who's tried to turn it into this literal rule book to control people, then we'll never understand a statement like this. But this is somebody who's danced with the art of Scripture. This is somebody who's found in this library of texts, something that makes their heart come alive and to connect to God. I love that, and I think it's a call that's very relevant to us today. What's the next one here? I don't even know what's coming next. Uh, If you want to study the social and political history of modern nations, study hell. That doesn't need any explaining, right? Just skip to the next one. Thomas Merton was very interested in political discourse and social action, not partisanly, not picking a partisan side, but as a Christian, he was very interested in the issues of his day. He was passionate about civil rights. He was passionate about nuclear proliferation in the Cold War period. He was passionate about all sorts of issues that were swirling around in the 50s and 60s of his day. This one I find really, really compelling, and I want to try really hard not to go on a side note here, but what he's talking about is this. If the version of Christianity that you've heard is that God will save a few people who either say the right prayer the right way or believe the right things, and everyone else is going to burn forever in hell, then you're probably going to understand a world that has a similar social setup, a world that has a lot of economic inequality, 
a world where the very few have all of the money, all of the resources, and all the experiences, while the masses of the people suffer. And you realize that maybe the ideas that we have about the afterlife or what we've talked about a lot in our series, good ideas about God and bad ideas about God, what we believe about God does affect the real world. In a world that has believed that God is going to torture most of humanity forever, seems a little bit more okay with war, seems a little bit more okay with people not having health care or people struggling day to day because it's basically written into your worldview. And I really like that Thomas Merton was able to challenge the bad ideas about God and see them writ large across society in the way that hell existed on earth and how we should stand against that, which is cool. I want to go in a whole other sermon there, but I'm not. I'm going to stay focused. Next thing. We are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves, and we are not at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. I think that one is self-explanatory, and I think it also can hurt if it feels true. I also think it can feel hopeful if we believe it possible to flip. I have found this to be one of the most intuitive truths in my own experiences with other human beings. I don't know how many times... I've had similar thoughts in my head of you're not at peace with other people (laughs) because I can tell you're not at peace with yourself. And I can tell you're not at peace with yourself because you're not at peace with God. And that's a less popular modern message to throw God in there. But when I talk about God, I want to remind you what I'm talking about is love, a word that we can't understand, the undergirding of the whole universe, the vibrations that connect us all together. If we can't be at peace with God, it gets real hard to be at peace with ourselves and with each other. Another contemplative idea. Is there one more tray? Is that it? The beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise, we love only the reflection of ourselves we find in them. This one hurt me. Maybe this means nothing to you, but this pretty much isolates how bad I am at loving people, whether it's my wife, my children, my best friends. This is a haunting quote to me because I think unconsciously, I hope not consciously, I'm often trying to change the people that I love so they fit something that I want out of them, which, guess what, isn't love at all. Somebody like Thomas Merton or Teresa of Avila or Julian of Norwich who spend the time to find out what God is like and then to teach us, this is what I'm so thankful for, can find in the depths of knowing God that God is not like that. I used to hear this saying in Christianity that God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. And I used to actually think that was a really cool saying, and maybe there's some cool things to that. But maybe God's love is even better than that. Maybe God loves you just the way you are, period. That's a harder thing for me to wrestle with. It's a harder kind of love for me to offer, but I like the challenge. I like to wrestle with it and think if it's right and see if it works in relationships. And I think there may be one last short one here that I just thought was cool, yeah, Perhaps I'm stronger than I think. <clears throat> I think this is a really holy thing to say about yourself. Is it possible that you're stronger than you think you are? Is it possible that you're stronger than you think you are? I think it's probable. <laughs> I think it's highly, highly probable that every beating heart in this room is way stronger than it thinks it is. And I love that. I love that something about spending time with God, something about experiencing God, made Thomas Merton walk away thinking something positive about himself. Because wouldn't God be like that? Wouldn't that what it be like to be in the presence of love, to walk away going, maybe I'm stronger than I think I am. That's what love should do to us. Here's what I want to do. We're going to come to the communion table today, as always, and share the sacrament. And I want to invite you as we take the wine or grape juice or the crackers into us to remember Christ, remember the universal Christ that God has made known that God is present in this world, in the suffering, in the masses, that God cares about things like justice. God cares about things like violence. God cares about love permeating everywhere. Here's the last thing from Thomas Burton that meant a whole really, really big deal to me when I first heard it from him. He said that he struggled with his active life in the 60s. I can't even imagine how crazy the 60s must have felt. Trying to figure out, overwhelmed, how do I change the whole world? And one of his main messages is you can't, so don't. Just go to your community. What you wish you could do for everyone, do for one person. What you wish you could do for the world, do for Flagstaff. And I think that's something that's very inspiring in a life of love. It's something that we can do. We can be present. We can experience God. We can feel love. And then we can find a tangible, close 
neighborhood near us and start doing that, which I think is beautiful. As we share communion today, remember that it unites us. It's a shared feast. It's a meal. It's a big dinner table where everybody's welcome. We celebrate an open table where everyone's welcome and optional. You shouldn't feel compelled. But as they sing this song, feel free to take Christ in us, receive from the prodigal father the unconditional love and compassion uh, of a God who loves us and is in us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of music today and the gift of nature and rain, for the gift of Thomas Merton's life. And I just pray, God, that it will be another great conversation starter in our hearts. Help us to experience your love, especially in the communion table, this performance art, as we take into us, this, these physical elements. Help us remember how loved we are by you, and let that be the center from which we can truly be at peace with ourselves and be at peace with others. We thank you that you are the Prince of Peace, that you live nonviolence to the very end. We receive the gift of community and connection and oneness and forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think that they'd understand when everything's made to be broken. I just want you to know who I am. I just want you to know who I am. I just want you to know who I am. I just want you to know. We're going to sing one last song, so feel free to stand and worship with us or stay seated either way. This one is a new song, so it should be pretty easy to catch on to, but um, if you need to, feel free to just listen and soak it in. wide a love that's sweet and help me lord to never keep it to myself and if 
my heart should dimly burn and if my feet should fail to run call my name and i will come right back to you cause there's no It's wide, a love that's sweet, and help me, Lord, to never keep it to myself. And if my heart should dimly burn, and if my feet should fail to run, call my name and I will come right back to you. Cause then Just as simple as this song I want to stay close to you It's really that simple I want to stay close to you My whole life long Cause there's no If you're interested in more learning about Thomas Merton, he wrote an autobiography called The Seven-Story Mountain. I think he wrote it in 1947. You can check that out. Or if you want a twist at the end of the story and you're into maybe conspiracy theories, there's a book called The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton. He died on December 10th, 1968 in Thailand at a Buddhist monastery, and he was 53, and he had just given a talk on interfaith relations as a Christian pastor talking at this Buddhist monk. And then that afternoon, they found him on the floor of his room, and he was either electrocuted by the ceiling fan or he was murdered. 
So have a good week, everybody. Thanks for coming to church. <laughs> so might, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, you can check that out. Nice twist at the end of the story. We don't really know for sure what happened to him on that day in 1968. So we are going to go hang out tonight. I hope you check out some of those resources. I hope he inspired you to think a little bit about our experience of God. Tonight, we're going to go to Fratelli's. Emily chose that because it's her last time here, and she loves Fratelli's. She was like, please, let me pick the restaurant and let it be Fratelli's. <laughs> None of that's true. But we are going to say goodbye to Emily because she's going back to Ohio. So if you want to come party at Fratelli's, um, and that would be a lovely thing to do. Come have some water or have some pizza and hang out. If you have questions, I'll be right over here. We also have a uh, sign-up sheet over there for the church um, remodeling project. So if you want to help us put in some flooring or baseboard or paint, that would be really, really great. As Carrie mentioned earlier, but actually we need to move that sheet out to that desk. So I just want to make sure that sheet's there. Carrie, can you maybe grab that? I think it's on that table. That would be awesome. All right, let me pray for us and then we'll go be together. God, thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for the chance for us to sing and share the sacrament and to think. Thank you for the gift of thought. Um, and I pray, Lord, as we leave today, that we will be filled with your love and that we will help spread that to our community, to those closest to us. In Jesus' name, amen.